in Romania, this is one of the best snacks that you can have because it just makes it very yummy in the tummy. But what if I told you that actually one cream filled pillow inside that bag can kill you? I'm bringing this up because when you are dealing with a Jobava London, it genuinely feels like half of this bag is uh, literally poisoned. So you can genuinely forget about that shit if you want to survive the first few moves. Now, even if your opponents are going to make it out of the opening, in every single second, they are still going to be walking on thin ice. So for today's video, I've prepared three model games, each one of them being crucial to make your opponents drop like flies. Enjoy. All right, everybody getting a white game. Let's open up with D4 and okay, opponent playing D5, meaning that uh, we're going to be probably getting a standard Jobava London. But let's see. Okay, we have to move E6. Now in this position, they can go for like a lot of things. Knight of six would be uh, the most common entering the main position of the Jabava London after bishop to f4. But uh, they can also play weird stuff like c5, where I recommend you play e4. They can play, uh, let's say, e5 is another weird move that sometimes happens. Um, this one I recommend you to take it. And uh, well, against stuff like bishop f5, you just play the bishop out. Anyways, now he plays e6. e6 is a bit of a tricky move order because at first it just looks kind of very dumb, you know, it's just like locking in the bishop. But on the other hand, uh, black has additional options to go for the pin. So it can make a lot of sense in that case. From my experience in this position, a lot of your opponents are simply gonna play like nothing has happened and they would just play knight f6. Which is a bit odd because you can start by developing the knight here. It would just be a bit more flexible to keep this bishop open. Uh, just a little side note that you want to uh, keep in mind. And okay, on c5. This is, I think, the first moment where perhaps uh, a lot of you may be tempted to rush a little. And uh, play the somewhat uh, very tempting knight to b5, okay? Whenever black is playing c5... Uh, Against the Jabava London, knight b5 becomes very kind of, uh, you know, problematic. However, the issue is that the knight is not going to be defended onto the b5 square. Meaning, knight b5 allows queen a5 check. And, uh, well, sorry, that was not the right arrow. Uh, yeah, point is, you just have nothing better than retreating the knight, which is no good. So before you play knight to b5, make sure this is going to be defended. So you're not vulnerable against the check. So for this, we play e3. Just ready to take back uh, with a pawn. c5 is a logical move, okay? Like c5 is just putting pressure in the center, preparing to play knight to c6. Uh, typical rule for d4, d5 games. You don't want to develop uh, the knight in front of the c pawn. We're kind of doing it, you know, as wide, but we have a special idea with the Jabava London, so it kind of cancels the rule. Now they go cd which is going to be recapturing and potential blunder knight to c6. He could also go knight f6. He has also a better idea to play bishop b4. And okay, we're saying all these moves out loud, but we are not able to predict what he is in fact going to be doing. And I already feel uh, very guilty for what I am about to play. Because when he plays a move like queen to b6, it's clear he wants to grab. And I think the best move objectively would be to hop with the knight. Threatening the fork and forcing a knight to a6. But really, what you can do a lot of the times when this happens, you can play a3. And I promise you're going to be winning a millions of games just because of this idea alone. Because, you know, the black players are just going to be very curious. You know, they're like... The bloody bastard didn't notice that I was attacking his pawn. I'm going to take. That is kind of like what they're thinking. Now, you pause the video and try to find the winning move for white. Because point of a3 was we're covering b4. So there is no more like a uh, queen check. And now we just want to play the knight. And notice how nicely we have literally trapped uh, opponent's queen. It's, you know, just like uh, you're setting up uh, a little cheese and, uh, you know, the little mouse uh, comes for it and just enters the trap. 
It is exactly like these, man. Uh, just, you know, play A3, give him a little cheese on B2, and it is simply what's going to happen. Because look, he really has no squares. Like, all of these are covered. This is covered. Knight move backwards. This is covered. He is just like so doomed. You have no idea. So, uh, yeah. I mean, he goes for like the best uh, try. Bishop to B4. Now, this is the time to think for a little. Okay? Even though uh, you may get him in the trap, you still don't want to like relax. Because I have a choice. I can just take and play up a piece. Or I can try to go for more. Do you think we should go for more? Alternative would be king e2. Just moving the king saying, okay, I still want the full queen. So, king to e2, we're kind of weakening our king a little. But on the other hand, I don't see a way for his queen to escape. I recommend if uh, you have a hard time figuring out what's up with king e2, you just stick with the simple uh, play and get the extra piece. I'm gonna go for blood here. I'm gonna king e2. Just, uh, I want my queen, you know. I, I paid for a queen, I want my queen. I'm not like, oh, you know, maybe we'll just give you a bishop so that he doesn't bother us, you know. No, I, I want what I paid for. I played a3 to win the queen, I want that queen. So, king to e2. Now, the only kind of issue that I believe we're going to be having is, uh, okay, how do I finish development? He goes queen takes on a3. So he's trying to like, at least steal another pawn. So material balance. I saw just another crazy trap that we're going to play, but material balance. We got a queen. He has rook and pawn. Actually rook and two pawns. But you pause the video. Try to find the winning move again. Even more winning than current position. Because I'm telling you, this can be a target. And no, it's not like knight b6. That doesn't make any sense. It's going to take your knight. But you can make a preparatory move. Queen a1. Targeting the bishop. I would expect the bishop to just, you know, go back home. Maybe go back to b4. And... You really need to pay attention to this uh, kind of long distance duels between the heavy pieces. All right. You can just play a nasty move like knight to b6. Okay. The knight is untouchable because the rook is pinned. And yeah, I, I just feel like, you know, we're opening up the Pandora box with this game. Just so many traps coming all of a sudden. I, I, imagine just being in the situation of my opponent, just trying to play like a normal game, and you think, oh, I'm going to take a pawn on b2, and then all of this is happening, you know? It's just you're browsing on the internet, you click on, uh, you know, like a fishy link, and then your computer is over. So, obviously he's losing even a, another piece. Because there's no way to save both. He just plays king d7. I'm going to take this. There's queen c7 idea to uh, pick up the bishop even further. <laughs> Man, I, I just feel like I penetrated this guy's computer and now I'm just mining Bitcoin. This is just how powerful this thing is. And he, he doesn't even realize what's happening. Like, how, how are we able to do every single one of these moves? I promise it is still a mystery to my opponent. So, uh, yeah. This is what happens in a nutshell uh, when the Jobava London gets out of control, okay? It is just absolutely disgusting. I'm going to even go for a League of Legends analogy. Uh, well, probably like 10% of you guys know what is League of Legends. Uh, the other 90% have a life. But uh, yeah, pretty much I would say the difference with uh, Jobava London and normal London is that, well... Normal London is fine, but the difference is when the Jubava London goes out of control, it goes bad, bad, okay? Normal London is very safe, you're like never in trouble, you get a small edge, it's more like positional play. Usually leads to longer games, um, which is also good. 
But when the Tribe of London goes out of control, there's a champion in League of Legends, it's called Karawina, where it's like an okay champion, but if you feed that champion, okay, if you play bad against it, you're pretty much gonna lose the game because your opponent is able to press one button. Okay, it kind of feels the same here, uh, you know. Even It's even worse than in League of Legends with a Katarina, because he has one skill, only one button. In Jubava London, it feels like we have five different ideas that are going to be so deadly that he just has no counterplay. And you just got to see one of them. Uh, and C5, he plays Queen to B6. I'm telling you, like, objectively, we can even check it together with a computer. Whenever you can uh, force Knight B5, Knight A6, that is the best move. Uh, here, you can clearly see Knight B5 is preferred. And you just wear it to play a position like this. However, uh, you know, I really wanted to show you this trap. It is something that uh, you can just use because, you know, queen to b6, it is actually something that causes a lot of stress and pain to the white players just because they're feeling, mm, maybe I'm going to go queen c1, blundering the pawn, or maybe I'm going to go rook b1 and then I have a weird position. So this a3 is just such a nice little flexible idea, pretty much saying, okay, you wasted the move developing your queen there. Now, what are you going to do? They need to take because they feel the need to justify their previous move. But you already saw this is opening the Pandora box after knight a4. Queen is getting hit. He checked. And I'm curious whether king e2 was precise. Yeah, apparently, uh, you know, you can see here the computer eval. Both moves, uh, either King E2 or Taking, were kind of equally good. I went for King E2 just because uh, I'm a, I'm a greedy bastard, so I'm going to take that queen when I can. Uh, well, he went for the worst play, and now we even got to use the nice little uh, pin along the A file. And, you know, <laughs> 10 moves. This is pretty much what uh, Jubavalon can do. So with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody getting uh, a white game. We're going to open up with D4. We're facing an opponent that has rated almost 1,100. So it begins with a knight. We're going to play knight C3. Very important. Okay, do not confuse the uh, normal London with the Jubava. Jubava starts with uh, knight under the second move. Uh, Almost always, uh, unless, you know, they play aggressive moves that are kind of challenging your pawn. But opponent plays what is, uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest counters for the Jobavalon, which is knight f6, e6 move order. Also commonly known as the uh, Nimzo Indian move order. This is usually an opening that gets played after c4, e6. And the idea is to meet knight c3, that's threatening e4, uh, by pinning it. With a bishop so opponent perhaps uh, you know he either has something in mind against us or he kind of played it by accident trying to go for the name zone nevertheless we're gonna play bishop to f4 and now he has a choice okay and we see d5 it is important to know that uh, in case of the uh, trickier move bishop to b4 you don't want to be playing knight f3 because uh, that would allow knight e4 and it's not very easy to protect the knight. So the key move on bishop b4 is to go uh, e3, opening up the uh, square for the knight, just, you know, in case he goes aggressive, we have knight protection. So, plays with d5, okay? Just transposing to very mainstream stuff. Here, I like knight b5. You can also play the e3 move, but once again, you have to deal with the pin, so better to avoid the pin uh, if you can. Just gonna hop with the knight and... This is one of the main uh, theoretical positions where, uh, yeah, this is pretty much a very nice move just because uh, it's forcing a concession from black. I expect either the knight or the bishop. I think this is played around like 50-50. Uh, once you start climbing the ladder, you may see the check occasionally, but it's very rare uh, with the idea to... Uh, mid c3 with bishop to a5, defending uh, with the bishop, leading to some kind of um, sort of uh, unorthodox positions, let's say. Um, I have a video where I'm playing ginger gm in that variation if you want to check it out. But for now, he defends with a knight. Okay, now it is important to pay attention to the move order. 
I cannot stress this enough, okay? Like, the Jobav Alonso is not a very difficult opening. Like, pretty much you're gonna notice that we stick with the uh, same moves in general, but the move orders, it's really what makes the difference. So, you wanna start with E3, because once again, Knight F3 could be tempting. But, as a rule of thumb, we play E3 before Knight F3. It's just more flexible, and notice that after the most common move, when we go back with the Knight, there's going to be a threat of taking, doubling up the pawns. And it is already nice to see uh, this. This is by far the most played move in this position, but it's not the best. Uh, best is uh, to play bishop e7 and kind of delay attacking the knight. This is how every top player plays this nowadays as black, but you're never really going to face this uh, like below 2000, I would say. But you have a number of interesting ideas, uh, like, uh, you know, it could go c4, g4 interesting move there um, a number of lines you can simply play uh, knight f3 and then uh, h3 or h4 anyways i don't want to make this like super confusing so we're just going to be sticking with very basic stuff uh, for now and okay opponent being afraid of uh, taking he just goes back which is um, yeah a very natural thing to do this is uh, one of the most common moves uh, in the past uh, actually in one of the very recent videos uh, we showed how to refute bishop b4 and then taking on a6 knight f3 the variation is not like losing by force for black but i think it's kind of suffering and after knight e4 uh, we showed how to sacrifice uh, that pawn on c3 and uh, get very good compensation as white well in that position so you can check it out if you haven't already against knight on to c7 i'm just gonna develop okay you can start knight you can start bishop to d3 as well here it doesn't really change much i'm gonna start with the knight just so i can be in time with bishop d6 95 um here my favorite move is to block the trade but also a move like bishop d3 is totally okay like uh, this structure where you get the double pawns as long as you have uh, bishops on the board you are just gonna be getting a very nice attack against the enemy king and it feels like we're playing with an extra piece so I'm just going to do 95. We generally take uh, with a pawn as often as we can in these structures, getting rid of the knight so that then we can get an attack. And I really want you to look at this whenever you see this sort of typical situation when they have a bad bishop, you want to think of checkmating black. This is really how we're going to win. Because if you stick with normal stuff like, I don't know, slow play, castling, doing whatever, random moves you're not really going to be better, okay? You want to really uh, take advantage of your uh, yeah stronger aspect of the position, which is the fact that your bishop is open, meaning, okay, we're just going to... Uh, we have to materialize that into an attack, else, you know, it's just going to be a balanced position. Opponent plays a6, which is kind of like a typical move, I guess, uh, probably preparing this move. I'm just trying to, you know, get some redemption for the knight, and... In this position, I think a lot of you would, you know, castle with both hands, which is, first of all, a little bit strange to do. You're supposed to castle with only one hand. But I would even go ahead and say that uh, we can delay castling. And very important, do not make the mistake to go g4, okay? You want to approach these positions uh, pretty much exactly as you're trying to pet a cat. Okay, you go g4, g5, you're going to scare the cat away. No, you need to go slower. So for this reason, we start with the queen, you know, slowly getting closer to the cat. And then, you know, you go for the final touch. Hopefully that's going to work. It's not always, you know, cats are pretty delicate and tricky creatures. But uh, yeah, I think this is the best approach by far. And already we see h6 by my opponent. But you know what that means? The pawn on h6 is what we like to call a hook. Not, you know, like a hook in, fin in fishing. But it's kind of like a nice little pawn that we can use as a target. And the easiest way to use that as a hook is go g4, g5. And that is pretty much uh, not going to slow down, but speed up our attack. So it's actually a very funny situation where uh, my opponent played the move h6, which is a very common mistake, thinking that he's, you know, going to slow down our attack. In fact, this move uh, is only making thing, uh, things worse. It's just that 
our initiative from this point will start snowballing. Imagine we get g4, g5. That is going to be a mating construction, okay? He plays knight h7, which is kind of like a good defensive attempt. Uh, because in these positions, what he also needs to watch out for is bishop sacrifice. That could also be deadly. But on knight to h7, I'm not like super sold on the idea to sacrifice because there will be f5 and the position kind of closes down for a little. Like I can see a way to pick up the exchange, but yet again, I'm not convinced. So one thing that can be very uh, effective for this structure is castling long. That's why you don't rush with castle. When you feel like, you know, every single one of your opponent's pieces are passive, usually you can't afford to long castle just to give yourself a little bit more space with this pawn push. And because g4, g5 seems harder to achieve, I think I'm going to play g4. And then I'm going to maneuver a bit with queen g3, h4, g5. The only thing that I need to watch out for is if g4, queen g3, maybe g5, trying to trap this bishop. However, that, you know, feels like a very risky move. Even if he wins my bishop, I think he's just kind of committing long term for weakening his king, which may not be very obvious at first, but uh, yeah, we're going to see. I don't think we'll sacrifice, but... Uh -huh. Yeah, let's think for a little. Gotta speed up because I don't have a whole lot of time on the clock. But I want to go queen, uh, queen g3. Which is a strange move, but I think it's a nice exploit against knight h7. There is no more knight h5 idea. I am threatening to take. And I'm also setting up a hidden idea. Because it is very easy to forget about that knight on c7. And he plays bishop g5, which is a good move. Uh, I'm going to go h4. I think I had maybe... Interesting ideas. I don't have time to calculate, so I'm just going to go h4. And here, taking with the pawn was interesting. I could also take with the queen and open up the path for the g-pawn push. So I think I'm going to stick with that. f6 just allows the knight to plant on g6. It's, you know, going to be a very nice little tree that's going to grow up there. And uh, on queen to f6, obviously, I do want to uh, avoid the trade. Yeah, he plays it. It's a very uh, sensible idea from my opponent. Because he's, you know, on the defense. It would just be kind of like such a relief for him to exchange. Because he's going to be less likely to get mated. However, even trading and playing g4, assuming he takes with the knight, would have given us a very nice push in the endgame. Because still, the bad bishop is an issue. Uh, he always needs to watch out for this idea, by the way. Uh, potentially combined with knight h6. So this is huge threat. I think maybe he already has to play king h8. In order to, you know, avoid uh, a quick disaster. But yeah, he plays c5. And I think we just have knight g4. I could have gone dc. That's like literally a free pawn. He wanted to like activate a little. But knight g4, double attack. He cannot like keep everything together. So queen there. Gonna take that with check. Exploiting the pin. And then I think we just run away. You don't need to like uh, spend more time there. This is like a common mistake maybe that... A lot of people will be making after taking such pawn. They just lose a lot of time, you know, thinking, oh, I took that. Let's see how I can improve my position. No, dude, it's just like you completed the biggest money heist of your life. What are you going to do? Are you, you know, just going to sit there with the bags of cash waiting for like the police to come up? No, you do that. You just leave as soon as you can. Okay, just try to, uh, yeah, not leave any tracks. Okay, 95, just getting the best knight of all time. Pretty much like, I think it's the so-called octopus knight because it's eyeing all the squares and he, at this point, he has no way to like stop this massive fork. So he pretty much hit uh, another jackpot with knight g6, taking the queen, the knight hangs as well. So his position falls down, uh, you know, just like, you know, uh, uh you're removing the bottom part of a house card or like a ha or like a card uh, castle. I don't know what you guys call that. <laughs> uh, we're going to take. And now his positioning is done. For the rest of the game, notice that still the bishop never gets to see the light of the day. So uh, that is pretty much uh, the main issue. I told you he has bad bishop. You try to checkmate. 
we're gonna go after the game uh, over like a potential uh, scenario where let's say what would have happened if he didn't allow Nigi for with immediate concrete win because I think uh, it's instructive to know how to put pressure even when you know they don't uh, crumble like this fast how you are supposed to play against like best defense so I just sacrificed a knight to get a bit more clearance and uh, speed up the mating process <laughs> gonna go knight f4 has to go like back I don't see like the mating one which is a bit funny uh yeah i hello can we mate in one i don't see it i'm just gonna check i think this is gonna be made in like a few moves so i think it's all good mm. opponent playing it down of course just because i don't have a lot of time on the clock so uh i think that's good for him but also with increment gaining five seconds each move it shouldn't be a problem so only move now to block with the bishop and that is just gonna be a mate so, okay, I think I explained uh, the opening pretty much in like uh, great depth and yeah, he played a6, I would have uh, expected like an a6 move to be knight b5, but it's, it's kind of strange, like if you think about it, my opponent played a6 and then h6, so for him, he may be the type of player that when he's running out of ideas, he's like, okay, let me make this sort of lufts and um, wait a bit. Which I don't think is like really a great strategy. I mean, his position is objectively slightly worse already because he's playing inferior line. That is so common. By the way, this is one of the main reasons why Jabavalon is such an effective opening, especially like below 2200. Everybody is going to enter this. Like I even had this position against grandmasters online and you can literally crush them you know like they drop like flies literally uh, because the position is so bad you have such a simple game plan you get your queen to h3 you go g4 g5 and you get an attack key golden rule that uh, i didn't mention during the game is if he plays c5 threatening to go c4 and uh, cancel the bishop you want to go dc so anything to avoid c4 and then do the same plan and castle and the very funny idea can occur after d4 if you take and he takes to the bishop thinking that okay black is just trying to destabilize our setup but then all of a sudden he can long castle and he's just gonna be kind of trapped on this diagonal forever it's objectively lost already one of the main ideas being that if he ever tries to unpin you can try to pause the video and find the best move for white because we can just go for the good old Greek gift and yeah, not only like a Greek gift, but simply winning the queen. So this is check, intermezzo, uh, pick up the bishop at the end, uh, white is winning. And if he plays it slow, yeah, he has gone for h6. Now I was, you know, quite impressed by uh, knight h7. That really kind of uh, slowed down our attack a little. Maybe it would have been even more precise to do queen g3 idea to take and some potential discoveries because usually yeah the problem with queen g3 is that he always has knight h5 but now with the knight on h7 he no longer gets that but i think can't go wrong with castling and yeah then queen g3 i think was fine the other idea would be to just play g4 okay i just didn't have a whole lot of time and i figured out that Queen g3 is such a, you know, unpleasant thing to deal with. Just imagine he plays king h8. I was counting on something like knight f7. And this. Simply winning a pawn and he just, you know, Schweitzer on the dark squares. He just has no moves, like bad bishop. This is, you know, like a disaster. Queen g6 potentially coming with mate. So... That's why I played the somewhat uh, unusual queen g3 because of the somewhat weird knight h7. But yet again, if you just play g4, I think that would have been completely fine. And during the game, I mentioned queen g3. Now that I look at it, I also realize that there is queen g2, which I think is even simpler. Okay, let's just imagine he makes random moves. You go queen g2 just so that you can play h4, g5 and avoid this potential issue that, okay, even if he plays g5, yeah, according to the computer... White is still winning in a position like this, I think no matter how you take, just because his king is so weak. So I told you this during the game, it 
was feeling like intuitively we should have enough attackers. But yeah, if you're like unsure about this, no need to allow uh, the peace sack. You can just play queen g2 and I think this is like equally good. As long as you're gonna get to push g5, you know, the attack is gonna be uh, crashing and f6 is never a thing as of knight g6 and uh, the knight is gonna leave there uh, rent free for the rest of the game. And once again, keep the same plan, maybe even bring the rook and um, the attack is crashing. So, yeah, he played this, we just went for simple moves. Even here, you have no idea how unpleasant it would be to defend an endgame like this. Imagine g5 is coming. If you're not careful, like let's say you're just making some sort of random move, I don't know, like this. Move the knight, there is going to be check. Also, let's ignore that. Just double up the rooks. He's still in some kind of like a funny mating net, so... Even endgame uh, was suffering for black, but uh, of course, when you have a position like this and uh, you're putting imbalance, whether uh, you still have attacking chances, then you generally just want to keep queens. Uh, so we did that. He has to like probably leave because I'm threatening knight g4 or play king h8. And then, you know, I'm like considering a move, maybe simply like f4 and then go queen f3. Like, no matter what he does, it's very hard for him to develop. Just look at his position. Let's say you go queen f3, he does bishop d7, you just go g4, g5. It's just, uh, you know, a for less uh, push on the king side. So, yeah, I think that's pretty much all about the game. Knight g4 was just kind of, like, finishing it. He doesn't really have uh, any counterplay play after that. If he would have played c4, there's bishop h7, and then... Uh, you have an extra pawn and a pretty nasty attack. I mean, a move like 95 um, could be good. And an idea that I would be considering, even queen g5, funny, you know, queen trade, like this, because f6 you have check. And if he takes, you still get a huge attack. And if he like avoids, say he goes whatever, maybe you just have rook h3 idea. And it's a nice way to get to his king very quickly. So um, yeah, I think this is like literally a deep analysis Perhaps last thing that you guys may be wondering, and this is like, I think, the best defense that black can try out in these positions is, let's say he goes queen e7, we go queen h3, and now he sets up uh, something like g6 to annihilate uh, these two pieces, let's say. Well, first of all, this can be killing, you know, get that pin, he's gonna be like in deep trouble, but also consider uh, just bishop h6. Just to like move the rook somewhere, you go f4, support the knight, castle, g4, f5, maybe g4, g5. Uh, yeah, like I think a potential uh, plan that may be underrated here, it's castle and then queen h4, rook f3, rook h3, bishop g5, and uh, pressure on the knight, h7 is going to be very weak, so um, yeah, the rest is just very easy to play in this uh, typical, uh, yeah, I like to call it reversed stonewall structure, so... With that being said, I think we can really move on to the following game. All right, everybody, getting another white game. We're going to be trying out uh, another Jupa of London, hopefully. And he plays d5. going to begin with a knight. And next move, we're going to be going for the bishop. And we get very normal stuff. This is, yeah, by far the most uh, popular thing that black can play. And now they have a choice, all right? This is... Uh, a position where they can, you know, a lot of the times in this rating range still, I would say around like maybe 20, 50% of the times they're going to blunder. Knight e6, knight b5, win on the spot. They can play bishop to f5, where I recommend you go f3, g4. Go for the pawn push. They can play e6, where I like knight b5. Um, or, mm, yeah, there's also Grunfeld, but rare for this rating range. So, a6 or c6. Especially these days are very common because uh, the opening got a bit more popular recently. And people just have uh, nightmares about the knight landing on b5. Therefore, I expect you to uh, yeah, deal with this uh, very often. And you need to know how to play around these type of middle games where you're not going to rely on the quick uh, little trap. So, as a little thumb, we begin with uh, e3 before knight f3. So, we do that. And... Uh, he still has options, so when the bishop lands uh, on f5, you already know what it is. We're gonna be going for uh, f3, and one way you can think about this, trying to remember the variation, is that 
uh, well, it may sound strange at first, but you can compare this with a bamboo stick. So, in case you didn't know, the bamboo grows underground for almost like five years. And then all of a sudden, just look at these pawns. It's gonna grow uh, like a bamboo stick because it's only five weeks. This shit is gonna grow for like 25 meters. And that is like 90 feet if you don't know what that is. Uh, so you can just think of this as the bamboo variation, you know? You can just literally get this pawn storm and it's like really unexpected. So uh, bishop f5, you play f3, there's pretty much like no way for him to stop this from happening. Um, unless they play h5, which is very rare, um, you can just like go bishop d3, uh, trade, go knight e2 and go for a uh, typical play, castle long or even, um, yeah, I would say castle short sometimes uh, against this specifically. But okay, we have the most common thing where I like to start with bishop to d3. h5 is also playable, but I like to keep the pawns like these against h6 because in the long run, we may want to have the idea to uh, push and kick the knight away so we can retake back with a pawn and uh, yeah we'll just go bishop d3 this is the simple approach and i recommend you always recapture with a queen picking with a pawn can be interesting but i think easiest by far is to take it back with a queen and uh yeah in case they don't take let's say play like a random move uh, that would just be a typical, uh, very actually grave positional error, allowing bishop takes on g6 and then queen d3. He's going to be having like such a weak pawn for the rest of the game. You have no idea. He just literally needs to uh, watch that pawn with the price of his life, uh, you know. And I'm going to be taking now 92 long castle pretty much against uh, anything that he does uh, from now on. Plays knight to c6. On bishop d6, uh, knight e2, important take back with the knight on f4 if he wants to go for the bishop trade. And for black, really, to get any kind of counterplay, he needs to play c5, where I would go uh, knight e2. I allow them to play c4, I go queen back. And after a move like b5, threatening b4, I like to play a3. Because let's say knight c6, we're still going long castle. And I think that black's attack is pretty slow in these type of positions, but I'll show you more details after the game. For now, it goes knight to c6. I'm just going to go like uh, knight e2 or castle. Both moves are fine. No need to be afraid of knight b4 because you can just go queen d2. Like, I've seen many people going a3 being afraid of that. That's not an issue. You can just, uh, let's say, slide back the queen. Okay, he actually goes for it, which is kind of funny. Uh, you can just get rid of the knight. Uh, on the next move and you know continue life as nothing has happened so yeah only way this could make sense if he finally plays c5 but i don't really think that's how these type of players are wired so i'm gonna go a3 and important that before you go to any aggressive measures like g5 you have the rooks connected because if you allow taking on h1 Losing both of your rooks, you're not going to be liking my coaching. So don't do that. Castle first and then g5. It's going to happen. Uh, expecting him to go, go queen d7 trying to long castle. Okay. Going with a king on that side literally feels like going for a swim in some poisoned waters. Because g5 is going to be opening up the situation and your king is going to be getting butchered. So, opponent uh, placing his king exactly under fire, showing why, uh, yeah, <laughs> you're not really supposed to go onto that side. Okay, now, he's a bit lucky because usually my queen would have been on d3 in this variation, being able to checkmate. So, I still need to take a bit of time to bring my pieces over. And I got many ways to do so. Here it's important like not to care about the pawn. Like some uh, more inexperienced players would feel a bit of anxiety about the fact that oh he's gonna be taking that pawn and then am I gonna get compensation? No, uh, that's very nice if he takes it. We get more attack. So we're not gonna try to defend that pawn. We just need to open up Queen's path so that we can mate. Knight uh, g3 is gonna go knight g5 and if I go queen h2 he's gonna try to run away with f6. Because if we check, he just has king f7. So I'm trying to like come up with a way 
to make this sort of escape uh, less efficient. So I think rook h5 is the way because we're threatening to double up and that's made. So it's forcing him to take a decision like bishop g5. I think it's lost after rook h1, bishop f4, rook h7, nice intermediate move, threatening to win the bishop and checkmate. So I think he's maybe losing a piece. Can he go back with a bishop? Huh? I need to reconsider that, but I'm sure white has something good there. And I think he's forced to do knight g5. But then after knight takes, I was kind of wondering if there is bishop g5 with a nice little idea that uh, we would be having, uh, yeah, just to clarify this, if uh, takes, we can take and then go uh, rook g1. And if he plays f6, we have f4 and the bishop is trapped because bishop h6, we can take it since there is a pin going on. Uh, and also like, uh, let's say, Bishop takes. I'm gonna show you more after the game because we're kind of running out on time. So yeah, I think just uh, rook h6, simple move. Hello. If bishop g5, I think we just exchange. And then I'm gonna go uh, rook h1. He's getting like some threats, but. Yeah, I don't know. It just feels like he's supposed to get mated very soon. Like his only move now is knight f6. Oops, I was about to make a stupid mouse leap. Has to play uh, knight f6 and then maybe a move like f4. The thing is, rook h8 is not mate immediately. So we shouldn't uh, rush with it. Knight f6, maybe even like a simple move such as, queen f uh, as knight f4. Opening up f for the queen. Yeah, I think knight f4 is... Uh, probably the most efficient uh, move to do in that position because knight f6, knight f4, if king g7, we have queen h2, cutting away the opportunity for him to trade rooks with rook h8. Because imagine if he's able to play that, there is no attack, but yeah, I just don't think he's gonna be in time. So, okay, he genuinely needs to move the knight because I'm threatening a one mover. I don't know why he's spending uh, so much time on it. So there it is. And now knight f4. Opening up uh, the path for the queen. Can he try like knight h5? I think just simply knight takes. And the key idea is uh, if he takes the rook, we have a nice little discovery. Knight f6. So yeah, he tries king g7. Uh, credit is to my opponent. He's defending well. But now you should be pausing the video and try to find the winning blow. Because I mentioned queen h2 as like the simple move. But I've noticed there is actually something even nicer. So, rook takes on g6, and knight e6 wins the queen. But can we actually just play e4? And I don't see how he's willing to save the queen. Okay, I'm just gonna go for a simple move, but I think e4 was also strong with knight e6 idea. I'm gonna go for, like, you know, the obvious win. Um, winning that. <laughs> and then, you know, hello, we'll just. Uh, with big material, and then his king is gonna be still weak. Well, we're gonna look after the game, uh, what would happen if uh, he would have taken the g5 pawn a little bit earlier. I think that would have been uh, leading to some fascinating uh, attacking variations that, uh, well, naturally, I think should work in our favor because we had the open file. But uh, yeah, I think now this is a nice uh, little maneuver that it's easy to overlook when h2 targeting c7. And the point is king d7, we can start checking and infiltrating there. So yeah, he allows me to get in there. There's also like knight d5. I think I'm going to begin with this. And then this is going to be deadly. Uh, I'm cutting away like all these squares. So, uh, and this is taken as well. He can only uh, go on to those squares. But I think queen c7 against like no matter what he plays, is going to be uh, leading to a mate very soon. So... Life is looking pretty good. Uh, and okay, like, he castled sure, but I've got to be honest. I would have been expecting it to be a bit of like an easier checkmate. But uh, yeah, I think this ended up being actually quite instructive because usually with the queen on d3, I told you there was just mate on h7. With the queen on d2, it actually took a little bit of work to... Uh, yeah, maneuver our pieces uh, around. So, okay, please rook d8. Maybe the other uh, capture was a bit more precise, but yeah, I think this one should be good too. Just gonna target these two pieces. He has rook f7. 
Okay, I could have gone for more precise things, but uh, yeah, I think that's nice, threatening to fork, because knight was covering that square. Just because I don't have a whole lot of time on the clock, I uh, decided to rush with this a bit, but I think should be good, because now we get the mate. So, uh, okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty much all about this game. It is, uh, I think, a somewhat complete guide on how to uh, yeah, take advantage of uh, his mistake to castle short. He's supposed to play queen d7, in my opinion, trying to long castle, where I would have gone g5. And it's very common that for this rating range, they would have traded, gone like knight g8, and I think then maybe a move like rook h7 trying to like target the spawn, provoking g6, and then he's gonna have a hard time castling because uh, f7 remains undefended. And a move like, let's say, e4 could be fine. Um, maybe something else could be considered, like trying to bring the queen around this file. Um, yeah, queen e1, second move by the computer, and just kind of symmetrical position where black has uh, less space. With that, I think we genuinely covered uh, every single one of uh, the options that black had. So I think we can just move on to the following game. Thanks a lot for making it this far into the video. I really appreciate you to the bottom of my heart. You have no idea, but in case you want to learn more about this opening, please feel free to check out the playlist that we have made. Because in case you haven't figured this out, we are making a rating climb with the opening. Enjoy!